This is Duke University. Thanks so much. I'm Richard Broadhead, uh, the president of Duke. And this seemed a good time to have a gathering of uh, our community. We know that we are living in extraordinarily turbulent times in our economy. And although I have been alive for more than a day or two, I don't think that there have been quite such turbulent times during my lifetime. Uh, uh, you know that uh, a year ago or so, a little more than a year ago, we began to hear about problems associated with subprime mortgages and various threats those might pose in the economy. But certainly, uh, it was a very rare person at that time who visualized that over the course of the succeeding months, uh, uh, institutions and corporations that had been in existence for decades and decades and decades uh, as flagships of the American economy would go under or lose their identity in ways that have happened. Uh, I don't know that people saw uh, even a month ago what would happen uh, uh, with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the arrangements, the new arrangements that would be made for them. Uh, we have, no one in my lifetime has seen a proposal for anything like the bailout that has been before Congress. Uh, and of course, I was in Washington when that came up for a vote and was, I believe, astonished as most people to see the free fall that the market went into after it was not passed. It comes back up for a vote today. Uh, we know that these are things that take place not only in New York or Washington, but that it's the nature of uh, the turbulence we're in, that it has now pretty much reached out to envelop everybody, whether they feel they have an active role in it or not. If you're a student and are wondering uh, where you might work next year, uh, that picture has uh, probably grown more uncertain in the past months. Uh, if you have a house you want to sell, uh, that's going to be different at a time when it's very uh, much harder for people to get credit for everyday transactions. Uh, if you're a person retired or contemplating retiring, wondering what your lifetime accumulation is worth and will be worth, uh, these have all become big, uh, big question marks. And so we know we live uh, at a moment when not only have the credit markets become more difficult than we have ever seen, uh, but where something has happened to the phenomenon of confidence itself, which underlies all such markets and makes them work. Uh, and I suppose the deepest question we all face nowadays is, how can confidence be restored? I just say a couple things more before I call on the panelists, uh, and one of them is this. this. The situation I mentioned is not a problem some other people have. It's a problem we all will live with consequences of, uh, even if we don't know what they are. But the other thing this crisis uh, has as its defining feature is how profoundly mysterious it remains to the great majority of the American public. Mysterious in terms of where it came from, mysterious in terms of uh, what the remedy would be, uh, would, would be for it if one is uh, indeed available, uh, and mysterious in terms of what its consequences will be for the times we'll live in in the uh, coming period. A university can't step forward to solve the problems of this time, but there's something a university can very usefully do. This is a place of education, and we have thought to make this a day of education about the turbulent economic circumstances of the present. I said to someone coming over here, the very essence of a university is every day you walk by people and you don't know who they are, and you don't know what they do, and you don't know why they do it until the day comes when you learn that that person knows more than anybody in the world about some subject that's highly germane on an occasion like this. Uh, and so I have reached across the schools of Duke University uh, to summon some relevant expertise in hopes that at the end of the next hour and a half, we will all have a little better sense of the answer to some questions. Where did this problem come from? What is, in fact, the magnitude of the crisis we live in? Because I think there's some uncertainty about that, or at least not a totally shared understanding. What is the remedy, and is the remedy proposed actually going to remedy this situation? And what lies ahead? What differences can we anticipate in the future world as a result of, this, of these times? Uh, I have asked five people to join me, and I'll introduce them in the order in which they will speak. And here's the format. I've asked people to speak for five to seven minutes. Uh, I, I'll uh, let them know when they reach six, and I will gag them if they reach eight. 
Uh, and then I will ask some obvious questions, and people can, not everybody won't answer every question, but people will rise to whatever bait they uh, choose to. Uh, and then uh, we will throw the floor open, and we'll take questions from, uh, from the assembled uh, until our time runs out. So let me introduce uh, our colleagues in the order in which they'll speak. Uh, Campbell Camp Harvey, who is the J. Paul Stick a professor of inter, uh, international business at the Fuqua School of Business and whose expertise is portfolio management and global risk management. That would seem like a relevant field. <laughs> uh, second, I would ask, sitting, sitting next to him on his right, uh, James Cox, who is the Brainerd Curry Professor of Law and whose fields are corporate law and securities regulations. And you might say, truthfully of him, that he wrote the book on some of these subjects and has helped to write the laws on some of them as members of drafting committees in both this state and California. Sitting uh, on my right and your left is Catherine Shipper, who is uh, the Thomas Keller Professor of Business Administration in the Fuqua School of Business and the head of the accounting department there. Before joining our faculty, she was a member of the famous FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, and to the extent that these things that hit us in the face with their obviousness derive from sometimes very obscure financial practices, uh, uh, this is a person who can shed uh, light on that for us. At the far end of our table is Craig Burnside, professor of economics, who before coming to Duke was the lead economist at the World Bank and whose fields are United States business cycles and government finance. And then sitting two from me, David Rohde, who is the Ernestine Friedel Professor of Political Science, whose field are is uh, American election politics and especially electoral politics during times of national stress and national uh, crisis. Uh, I, I don't know why I thought of him. Uh, the, uh, uh, let, let me begin, and I'll just call on these people for an opening statement in the order I mentioned them. So Cam Harvey first. Okay, well, it is uh, great to be here, and uh, it's hard to put everything in five to seven minutes, but what I thought I would do at a very high level, um, give a few opinions. Uh, when we look back uh, in history upon this episode, and it is a great episode uh, in terms of uh, huge downside, uh, there'll be some lessons and there'll be many explanations as to what happened. And there are a couple of themes. The first theme is greed, and a fundamental misunderstanding of the idea of risk and expected return. And let me be a little more specific here. I've got a choice for my portfolio, and I can invest in government bonds, US Treasury bonds, maybe get a 4% um, yield to maturity, or I could invest in maybe a corporate bond, maybe a fairly safe corporate bond um, that's got a AAA rating. And the yield on that might be 7%. So what do I do? Um, I could have the safe one for three, or the one that's a little risky, but not too risky for seven. Well, if I invest at 7%, I'm getting what's known as a risk premium, which means I'm being compensated for the chance that something goes wrong in that corporation. And it's possible that the something that goes wrong is a default, and I end up with nothing. Okay, so when you invest in something that's got a higher rate of return, there's a reason for it, and that is risk. And to put this in very simple terms, what basically happened was you go in and make your deposit at your local bank, let's say it's $100, they set aside $5 because it's required by the Federal Reserve to hold a reserve, then they take the $95, and invest in, let's say, subprime mortgages. Well, it seems like a great investment for the bank at the time because they have to pay you only 1%. But they're getting 11% yield on their subprime mortgages. The problem, of course, if something goes wrong in the economy, the value of those subprime mortgages goes down. And they could be faced with a situation that they go from $95 to $10. Now the bank's in trouble because they've got a liability, what they owe you, the $100, they've got the $5 on reserve, and they've got $10, and that's what the asset's actually worth. So you're in trouble. They owe you more than they have. If you mark 
the asset that they're holding, the subprime mortgage, to market. And that's basically the type of problem that we're facing, that to get a high rate of return for the shareholders at the time, you took very risky bets invested in high yielding securities that had high risk. An event occurred and basically many of these institutions are insolvent. The other lesson I think, uh, the main lesson is gonna be uh, the gross failure of risk management at many different levels. You know, I'm not saying you shouldn't invest in subprime mortgages, but you need to do it in a way that's consistent with the basic principle of risk management. And that principle, and by the way, we teach this uh, in our courses at Fuqua, <laughs> that principle is pretty simple. You look at the worst case scenario, and you make sure that your portfolio is structured so that you survive in the worst case scenario. And that's exactly what did not happen with many of these corporations. So it is a failure of risk management. It is also a failure on the government side. Um, this crisis is not a new crisis. We've known about the subprime problems for a year and a half. And the strategy of the government has been to go and basically uh, put out fire after fire. Seems like every day there's a new thing to do until it's too late and they have to do something dramatic. And when you do something dramatic at the last possible minute, um, maybe it's too late. And the piece of legislation that's before the Senate and uh, I guess uh, back to the House, I believe is filled with flaws. It does not instill a lot of confidence in me. One of the major problems with the legislation is that they are basically agreeing to buy some of these troubled assets at what's known as hold to maturity prices. Those prices are far above fair market value or mark to market value. So basically, it's no surprise to me that the American people are quite upset about this. Why should we go and bail out these people that took the risk to get that extra return and to pay them prices that are far above the fair market value? It distorts prices in the market, and it doesn't directly address the problem. On my website, I've got uh, a proposal that uh, I think is, is comprehensive. It is proactive. It moves with speed. Uh, one of the problems with the, uh, the current program is that it will take months to organize this. These assets are very complicated and very difficult to value. It's so different than the SNL crisis um, where basically you needed to drive around and take a look at some land in Texas and figure out the value. These are complex instruments. It's going to be months before we can get that going. So what we need to do instead is to move with speed and to deal with the troubled assets on a fair market basis, but at the same time, um, learn a lesson from our um, you know, fellow central banks uh, in Europe. In particular, I would learn a lesson from Sweden. In the early 1990s, they had a very similar situation. What we can do basically with the stroke of the pen is to make an equity injection, a stock injection into all financial institutions. It provides the liquidity to jumpstart the credit system. It, it happens within a matter of days, not weeks, and then deal with the trouble assets on a fair market value basis. This ensures that we don't overpay for these assets, the American taxpayer gets actually a rate of return because they're asking them to take some risk here. So they should get a rate of return on this. If you invest at full market uh, or uh, hold to maturity, there's little hope of a rate of return. And you also make the ingest, uh, investment into the, um, into the equity that happens quickly. It gives the bank the liquidity to make the loans. We cannot afford to starve small and medium sized businesses, consumers from, from credit. Without that credit, our system stops. It means losses of jobs. It means that we go into a deep recession. Nobody wants that. And uh, I think the plan as it's currently constituted is very problematic. Uh, and I hope that it is changed. Seven minutes. That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I meant, I meant. In a 
observing the time limit. Yes, not the content. Jim Cox. <laughs> well, uh, generally it's the case that to move forward, you have to look backward a little bit. And uh, so let me just talk a little bit about what contributed to this in the, from a regulatory standpoint. Uh, you could go back to 2004, late 2004, and you started finding uh, rumors in the marketplace that there was a housing bubble. Uh, on June of 2005, Chairman of the Fed, Alan Greenspan, said that he wasn't sure there was a housing bubble, but there was certainly froth on the edges. Um, and then two months later, uh, he started using the B word, that there was a bubble. Uh, and this is a concern because what you were finding was that house prices were shooting up and individuals in discrete income levels were, their savings rates were going down because the, their future and their kids' education, et cetera, was all tied up with the equity of their home, living off their home equity loans, et cetera, and banking on their funding, their retirement, their kids' education on price appreciation. The Fed did nothing, kept the interest rates low, because the engine that was driving the U.S. economy at that time uh, was the housing market, consumerism, but largely driven by, uh, tied in closely with upward appreciation and home values. About that time, beginning in early 2004, uh, accelerating in 2005, a number of states. Uh, North Carolina was one of them, California was another, Nevada, Florida, took at the state level steps at through their banking regulators and attorney general's offices to do something about predatory lending. Predatory lending is going out and encouraging individuals who had low incomes to borrow against their futures by getting mortgages that uh, were not really suitable. And the response to that, in response to the American Bankers Association, uh, was a series of rules by the Office of Thrift Supervision as well as the control of the currency. Both of those are in the executive wing uh, issuing uh, rules and saying that for large quarters that if you were a federal bank, any part of your operations, uh, not just your banking operations, any part of your uh, holding company structure was subject to uh, federal preemption of state rules on predatory lending. That case uh, on, arising out of those facts ultimately went to the Supreme Court and Supreme Court uh, didn't up uphold the authority of those rules. The result of that was states were taking action to roll back uh, predatory lending, which gave rise to much of the subprime mess, uh, 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 were no longer uh, possible to apply the rules. So at this point, honoring the uh, October being the Boys of Autumn month, uh, we have two strikes against regulation. The third strike came with something that Cam was talking about, and that's the risk to management, that the industry once upon a time, we had commercial banking and we had something called investment banking. Uh, we lost the last two investment bank, major investment banks, two weeks ago, which applied under emergency rules to become commercial banks. Uh, and they, investment banks were never regulated in the same level uh, as a commercial bank with respect to their uh, risks, the degree of leverage that they had. Uh, leverage means that the largest bankruptcy in history uh, was Lehman Brothers, $630 million in assets, eclipsing the prior largest bankruptcy in history, WorldCom, 104, okay, so almost a factor of six. That meant that of those $630 billion of assets that's in bankruptcy for Lehman, 611 of that was borrowed money, 97%. Their debt to equity ratio was 32 to one. Uh, so uh, pretty, pretty phenomenal. And in 2004, uh, under pressure from the European Union, uh, the federal government was under pressure to do something about regulating investment banks because the Europeans were regulating uh, investment banks, commercial banks, and we weren't doing anything about it. So we had to come up with some response. The industry, typical to fashion, which has gone on for at least four decades, said the market provides its own discipline. We can be honorable uh, boys and girls here and we can police ourselves. That, that was the decision that was made by the SEC in 2004 under Chairman Donaldson and the other commissioners, even though the commissioners were saying, well, we want to come in and take a look and make sure you're managing your risks, that uh, at the same time they realized full well that nobody there had a skill package to be able to accomplish that at the SEC. 
And so we deferred to the industry. That was the third strike. Uh, if one could add a fourth strike in this game, perhaps there's games like that, the rating agencies played a very uh, important role in uh, bundling these securities together in a way that uh, caused institutions to buy them thinking that they were AAA rated uh, and ignoring the fact that there was a huge vein of systematic risk that ran all the way through them. All of them were tied up with housing prices. And the rating agencies demonstrated here and again that rating a ratings are purchased, they're not earned. Uh, and the result of that is that a study very, it's out there on the Social Science Research Network, I'm about to finish up here, shows that the number of downgrades of, of, from AAA to junk bond status of instruments that are backed by mortgages, okay, was 10 times that of normal ratings if you had a situation in which it appeared that the ratings were taken out, pardon me, the product was taken out and shot for a rating among the rating agencies. So the fourth strike here was coming off of Enron where the uh, rating agencies misbehaved badly there, that Congress punted on regulating that group, uh, passed a milquetoast uh, sort of set of regulations under industry pressure, and the result is the rating agencies were able to survive, increase their bottom lines dramatically, uh, in the subprime mess. And then I'll leave you with one happy note, and that happy note is that we have still uh, coming online in the next uh, 18 months something like 18, oh, pardon me, $1 trillion of subprime mortgages that probably the failure rate on those will be somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 percent. Catherine Shipper. Well, thank you very much for being here. I'm going to talk about losses and uncertainty, and including uncertainty about the existence and size of losses. I'm an accountant, and so I'm going to talk about accounting. I'm going to give you two basic accounting ideas. Idea number one is the information for transacting idea. Absent compulsion or coercion, we won't see a transaction, that is the purchase and sale of an item, unless both parties to that transaction have sufficient, reliable information about the item and the terms of the transaction. They need enough information, and the information has to be reliable in the sense of trustworthy. A lack of information, low quality information, concerns on the part of the buyer that the seller has hidden information about the item, all of these reduce the willingness to transact. One major role of accounting and financial reporting is to provide information to facilitate transactions. For example, the purchase and sale of equity shares, um, lending and collecting on loans. So that's basic idea one. Basic idea two is the balance sheet idea. The balance sheet, as measured using accounting numbers, is supposed to show assets and out. resources at no more than the amount of cash those assets will generate. I'll return to that idea later. Okay. It's supposed to show liabilities, that's your obligations, at the amounts owed, or here. alternatively, what the yeah. borrower would have yeah, to pay fine. to settle those. Thanks. Okay. In the current environment, how did these two ideas go wrong? So they went wrong in four ways. This one is what I'll call the unreported obligation way. Loosely speaking, an unreported obligation occurs when a firm owes a payment or is obligated to stand ready to make a payment, but that obligation is not <coughs> How might that work in the current context? It might work like this. A bank establishes an entity to which it transfers mortgages. The entity issues securities to investors only source of payment for those securities is the cash That is, the mortgage is you want me to interrupt? the entity and pay the security. All the security. And if you're reading the financial press, the cash is the whole mortgage market operates. The logic of the balance We're working on it. dictates that the bank should record all of its obligations from the surveyor. If the bank has an obligation to the holders of those securities, the logic of the balance sheet idea says record the obligation. If the bank is sufficiently involved with the arrangement, it should show the whole arrangement on its balance sheet. My view 
is that the accounting problem is that the criteria for determining the accounting for these arrangements is problematic. The accounting appears to have allowed unrecorded obligations to flourish. Certain financial institutions appear to have set up entities, transferred mortgages to those entities, arranged for the entities to sell securities to investors based on the cash flows of those mortgages, and have accounted for those arrangements entirely off balance sheet, even though the institutions retained many risks and obligations to stand ready to provide financial support. This is a very technical accounting issue. It's not much discussed in the financial press. The Financial Accounting Standards Board that establishes the accounting guidance for this type of arrangement has acknowledged difficulties with the guidance. They have also alleged, and I agree with this allegation, that there were and are problems with the way the existing guidance was and is being implemented. That is, the financial reporting decisions made by managers in consultation with their expert advisors were not necessarily consistent with the substance and spirit of the authoritative guidance. The result? Investors were unaware of all the obligations that financial institutions had with regard to certain arrangements involving securities whose only source of payment was home mortgages. This is just like saying you violated the balance sheet idea, you didn't show all your obligations. A corollary to this is obligations that are recorded, but they're very hard to see and very hard to understand. And here we come to the world of unregulated credit derivatives. Credit derivatives can act exactly like insurance in case a borrower doesn't pay. So it's insurance against a borrower's default. They're not accounted for like insurance, however. And in the case of a credit derivative, it's not necessary for the person who buys the credit protection, who gets paid in the event of a default, even to own the loan or have any connection with it. This market is not transparent. It has no central clearing. It is, for the most part, unregulated, it means it's hard to see, it's hard to understand. The size of this market may have been 70 trillion US dollars at one time. It may be 55 trillion US dollars now, but it's hard to know. The accounting for this is very complicated, very technical. It is much less covered than the next issue I'm coming to. This is unrecorded losses. This comes in two varieties. The first one's very easy to see. In the case of the first example I gave you where the bank has an involvement with an entity and many obligations, if it doesn't record those obligations, it may have an unrecorded loss. The second one is the one you may have been reading about in the financial press, and this pertains to decreases in value of existing financial assets on financial institutions' balance sheets. Cam Harvey referred to a decrease in value from $95 to $10 Recall the basics of the, of the balance sheet measurement, and that is don't show your assets at more than the amount of cash they're going to generate. And he said the cash generating potential of this asset fell from $95 to $10. The question is, how often should this be measurement, measured, and what do we exactly mean by cash generating value? Well, the how often to measure depends on the purpose of the measurement. There are certain entities that measure their financial assets at fair value every single day because that's their business model. So they measure the entire left-hand side of the balance sheet of the entity at every day. Why? That's the way they run the business. Regulations differ, but let's say that in the United States, if you're a publicly traded firm, you're supposed to show your shareholders the value of your assets once a quarter. But what exactly do I mean by value and the amount of cash that would be generated? Fair value measurement says it is the amount of cash that would be generated if the item or transfer were sold today. It represents an exchange value in the marketplace under current marketplace conditions. So in the case of shares of stock, fair value is not what you paid for the shares of stock, it's what you could sell them for today. In the case of your house, it's not what you paid for it, it's what you could sell it for today. It's not what you hope to sell it for or expect to sell it for at some future time. It's what you could sell it for. That price is, of course, determined by market participants and market conditions. Fair value of an asset is the opportunity cost of continuing to hold it. It reflects current economic conditions. Now, what are the features of fair value accounting that have brought it into the press and indeed into some proposed legislation that is going to be considered by the Senate this evening? My view is that there appears to be significant misunderstanding 
about exactly what fair value accounting means and does among those making proposals to, as they put it, suspend fair value accounting or suspend mark-to-market accounting. There is nothing new in accounting and financial reporting about marking assets down, that is, reducing their balance sheet carrying values when value declines. This has been around for many years in accounting, and in particular, it's been part of the authoritative guidance of US GAAP since 1993, um, 15 years. Some argue that mortgage-backed securities, in particular, are only temporarily declining in value and should not be remeasured to fair value. To those persons, I say, if this is a temporary decline, you ought to be buying more, but you're not. <laughs> Furthermore, do we really want balance sheet carrying values to be based on hopes of holders for their recovery? <laughs> These wishes for recovery do not reflect current marketplace conditions. We'd like to have the value today, the opportunity cost today. Fair values might be difficult to measure. That is, some of the arrangements that have to be measured on balance sheets are quite complex. That's a feature of the securities, not a feature of the accounting per se. The assets might be illiquid. That means it might be difficult to find a buyer for them. That's a feature of the securities and the marketplace. Recall basic idea number one. We don't see transactions if there's not sufficient reliable information on which to base a transaction price. Illiquidity in the marketplace is a symptom of a lack of information. It's not a cause of a lack of information. It's a symptom. The lack of trades is itself both a symptom of the lack of information and an indicator of a decline in fair value. Those who say that volatility in share prices is unacceptable and driven off change, small changes in asset values should take to heart Jim Cox's statement of a 32 to 1 leverage ratio. If your balance sheet on the right-hand side is leveraged 32 to 1, a tiny perturbation on the left-hand side of your balance sheet is magnified greatly in terms of your equity values. Finally, to those who say suspend fair value accounting, I say that withholding information from the marketplace simply makes things worse. It violates basic idea number one. Investors and others won't transact if they don't have timely information on which to base transaction prices. Craig Bernstein. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to repeat some of the things that you've heard already, um, some of the things that each of the speakers before me has said. So not surprisingly, I'm going to tell you that this crisis was brought on by bad real estate lending. Um, and real estate lending is risky. Um, but there's nothing wrong with the fact that real estate lending is risky, and there's nothing really wrong with the financial sector that takes those sorts of risks. because. You know, we need a reminder that all productive economic activity is risky. Okay? But to understand how some of these bad bets, because these ended up being bad bets, to understand why they ended up becoming a crisis rather than just some isolated bad real estate bets, you have to understand the nature of the bets that the banks took and how those brought us to where we are today. And I think the key thing is that these banks took very big bets on real estate. Okay. Um, and these bets would have probably been profitable if the economic situation that we had in 2003 or 2004 hadn't changed. That's not to say it was a good idea to take those bets, but in a different state of the world, they might well have paid off. Um, so what has changed? Well, in 2004, the Federal Reserve started raising short-term interest rates. Uh, raised its federal funds target that it uses as monetary policy instrument to fight inflation. And consequently, all these adjustable rate mortgages that were out there, including the subprime mortgages, started having the, the interest rates adjusted upwards, and people began to default on their mortgage payments. Um, and as a result of that, and the fact that the economy softened and real estate prices fell, um, all of these things turned these bets very bad. Okay. But you still might wonder why things, such bad things could happen to bank balance sheets um, that would, would literally drive the banks under. Sure, they would take some losses, but why did they end up going under? And that's where I come to another point that was made, which is that the key aspect of this is leverage. 
you know, if, if I had all my net worth invested in the stock market, that would be very risky, and my net worth would go up and down wildly as the stock market gyrates, but I would never end up having negative net worth. The worst thing that could happen is I could lose all my capital in the process. I could go to zero if the stock market went to zero. So the key thing to understand is that banking doesn't work that way. Banking is fundamentally a leveraged activity. Suppose instead of investing all my net worth in the stock market, I invested twice my net worth in the stock market by borrowing an amount equal to my net worth in order to do that. Well, now the stock market only has to drop 50% to wipe me out. Now th think about me being even more levered. Well, it doesn't have to drop even as much. So this point about Lehman Brothers being so highly levered means that even a small shock can drive the bank under. And that's, that's the key thing to understand. Now, um, you know, why did the banks take on such risky levered positions? That's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, subprime, subprime lending was very profitable in 2003 and 2004. It looked like a pretty good bet. Delinquency rates on mortgages were really low. The money market was incredibly liquid. It was easy for banks to get funds to make these loans. And uh, so it looked like good business and banks did more of it. Okay. Now, you know, obviously it was risky and the risk was realized ex post. So the question is, you know, why were banks getting into this business so much? Why did they take so much risk? One possibility is that they didn't really fully understand the risk involved in the positions they were taking. Um, after all, you know, even if a lender goes bad, the lender ends up, a loan goes bad, the lender ends up with the house. So they knew that even if a loan went bad, they wouldn't end up with nothing. Um, also, after the 2001 recession, the Fed maintained interest rates at extremely low levels in a way that was sort of unprecedented historically. And this may have led banks to not really believe that interest rates would rise at some point in the future when signs of inflation showed up. But actually what the Fed did was wait a while to raise rates, and then when it did raise rates, it raised them very sharply, and liquidity exited the market uh, rather quickly, and that happened between 2004 and 2006. Um, the other thing is banks may have believed that if things started going wrong, the Fed would actually ease back on its monetary policy targets. Um, this is the much talked about, if you read in the newspaper about the Greenspan put, that's basically what you're reading about. Um, so banks may have had these misperceptions. You know, even worse, they may have been counting on a really big bailout if things went really bad. Okay. So that's just some, some sort of economic background. How should the financial crisis be addressed? That's a tough question and a, not a question that I'm particularly uh, able to answer. Uh, but I think one thing to keep in mind is that it's really not clear fully yet what the nature of this crisis is. It's not clear if it's a full-scale solvency crisis where there's more bank failures just around the corner uh, because of bad loans, or if this is something that has a lot more of a liquidity nature problem to it where some of the additional banks that are getting in trouble are just getting into trouble because they have pretty good balance sheets but they're not getting the kind of flow of short-term funding from the money market that they would normally be able to get. Um, and the answer to the question of how to deal with the problem really rests on figuring out which of these two situations it is. And in the short term, I think what the policymakers should be doing is providing liquidity support to the, to the banking system while they figure out what to do with the banks that are clearly insolvent and while they figure out which other banks are on the border of insolvency. Um, one of the things that I wanted to comment on is, you know, what the impact of this is on the, on the, uh, on the economy. Again, this issue of liquidity is very important because economic activity rests very heavily on there being a liquid banking system. You know, the way companies operate is they borrow money to pay their wage bill and to pay for the inputs that they use in, produ in producing the goods and services that they, that they provide us. 
Um, they don't pay for these things out of cash most of the time. But if the banking system sort of is closed to them, that's how they have to do it. They have to pay for stuff out of their cash balances. And they can't do that for a really long period of time. So the critical thing is that the, that's another reason the Fed has to keep the system liquid, is simply to keep the economy, the normal functioning of the economy going. The other economic aspects of things that I, I wanted to say something about is kind of the budgetary impact of this. That's something else that's not entirely clear. Um, in some banking crises, like the ones that happened in Norway and Sweden in the early 90s, the fiscal impact of the crisis wasn't very big. And that had something to do with the way the, um, with the, way the bailouts were designed. And that's why you're hearing things. If you read the newspaper, if you Google Swedish banking crisis, you'll find some interesting information about how they designed their bailouts in such a way as to minimize the fiscal cost. Um, something else I should just say something about is how big is the crisis? You know, how big is this as a, as a, as a cost to the government? Um, as, uh, one way of trying to figure that out is just to express the size of the bailout as a fraction of GDP because expressing it as a fraction of GDP kind of tells us how much of the whole economy's income is this going to cost us. And if the entire outlay for AIG and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the bailout, if all of that was a net cost to the government, which we don't know yet, but if that was a net cost, it would be about $1 trillion. That's about 7% of GDP. So that gives you some idea of the scale. That's bigger than you know, the federal military budget. It's bigger than the cost of Medicare in a year. It's bigger than the cost of Social Security in a year. So it's not a trifling amount. On the other hand, it's not an overwhelmingly large amount. It's bigger than the SNL crisis, which was about 2 to 3% of GDP. But it's nothing on the order yet of the kind of crises that took place in Thailand or Korea in 1998, which amounted to something like 20 or 30% of GDP. So, you know, at least for the moment, the apocalypse doesn't, you know, maybe isn't right around the corner. Um, I guess the last thing I want to say something about is just how all of this might affect the dollar. And, um, you know, because the value of the dollar is intimately tied to the fiscal soundness of the U.S. government. And anything that weakens that fiscal position naturally should weaken the dollar. Um, again, because we don't know the fiscal cost yet and it's not enormous, it's not clear that this is going to overwhelmingly weaken the dollar. Um, but it certainly isn't going to make your European vacation uh, cheaper anytime soon. Um, and another, you know, so related to that is kind of the issue that I think, you know, there's kind of this view that maybe a crisis like this is going to threaten the U.S. dollar's position as the reserve currency that everybody kind of uses for international banking transactions. And I'm a little skeptical about, about that uh, for a couple of reasons. One is I don't think this event has proven to be as calam calamitous enough to warrant that sort of fear. The last time the world's reserve currency change was after World War I when the British pound was replaced by the dollar. But, the, you know, Britain went from being the world's net, big net creditor to being one of the, to being a big debtor as a result of World War I. So it was a much more calamitous event. Um, and it's not obvious what would replace the U.S. dollar at the moment, you know. The only thing you can really point to is the euro. And the Europeans seem to have their own problem with banks right now. Thanks. So, that's about um, all I have to say. <laughs> and last, David Rohde. Well, for my topic, it's the politics of the situation. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to focus in my remarks on the, the politics of the bailout bill that was defeated on Monday because that illustrates the important political considerations that are invoked in, in this situation. And uh, as a generalization, I would say that the greatest enemy of the bailout bill was the calendar, or more precisely, the ways in which the calendar affected the political calculations that were going on. So first aspect of the calendar is the proximity to the congressional elections. Uh, we're 
five weeks away from uh, uh, a vote in which all 435 House seats are up. And this invokes the personal political survival of the members of the House of Representatives, which is at least one of, if not the most important consideration that would be on, on their minds. Members perceive substantial negative public opinion about the plan, and they were uncertain about how much their vote would affect their fate. Um, you've, you've heard here and uh, you hear in the press about how much the economic markets hate uncertainty. That's pikers compared to how much politicians hate uncertainty. <laughs> so uh, so uh, to illustrate this, overall, 60% of House Democrats and 33% of House Republicans voted for the bailout bill. Among members who are retiring from Congress, 100% of Democrats voted for the bill and 82% of Republicans <laughs> voted for the bill. On the other hand, in those races that the independent Cook political report Great rates numbers. as the most competitive, 38% of Democrats voted for the bill and 14% of Republicans voted for the bill. So this was says those members who, who were least threatened, those who were quitting, were willing to provide support for the bills. Those members who were most electorally threatened were least likely to provide support for the bill. A second aspect of the congressional elections approaching is not the individual survival of members, but the collective political interests of the parties, and in particular, the political concern about who would control the majority in the House of Representatives after this election and setting the stage for who would control it after the next election. The control in this election is probably not very much in doubt, but even that was thrown into doubt by the, the depth of the crisis. And everybody's calculating two years down the road what's going to happen. With respect to that aspect, it was in particular Democrats who were very concerned about being made to pay the political burden of this bailout when they think that the political burden should be on the opposite party because of what the Bush White House and the Republicans that controlled Congress for six years uh, um, had, had done in this. So, so if we look at the vote that's likely to take place in the next few days, um, it's more likely that the additional votes for a plan are going to have to be produced on the Republican side than on the Democratic side. Indeed, leading up to the vote, Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer communicated to the Republicans that they would have to provide uh, 80 to 100 votes for the uh, bill in order for it to pass, and the Democrats would provide the rest and the largest part of the bill. Instead, the, the Republicans only provided 65 votes. Um, had they provided 77, the bill would have passed. Um, so Pelosi's calculations were right, and it sort of sets a ceiling on, I think, what, what the Democrats are going to be able to do. A third aspect of this is not a congressional election approaching, but a presidential election approaching. And members are concerned in their calculations about how the choices that are made might affect the political prospects of the candidate of their party. And so this was involved with John McCain suspending his campaign and coming back and getting involved in negotiations and uh, things like that and the calculations that surrounded that. Fourth, uh, another aspect of the presidential election approaching, and that's the fact that President Bush is in his second term. That is, he's coming to the end of his presidency. Uh, 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 Bush is the, the, the popular term and the political science term is lame duck and that he, uh, uh, he only has a few months to serve as president. Members, when they make their calculations about the influence of the president, one of the things that profoundly affects that calculation is the prospects of the president being able to do things for them or being able to do things to them. And uh, uh, as a president's administration wanes, the prospect of the president being able to do either of those things declines. Uh, and at this close to the end, it declines precipitously because there's almost nothing left. The Congress is going to adjourn, uh, probably, uh, or perhaps come back for a lame duck session. But 
uh, uh, pre the president's influence is very limited. Indeed, this is a really remarkable political circumstance. One of the, one of the Democratic leaders remarked, he, he said he couldn't remember the, ever a situation in which the leadership of both parties and the president were on the same side and failed. And that, that illustrates how difficult a political set of circumstances uh, this is. Finally, uh, uh, in, in this vein, um, uh, there's the fact that uh, there's a new Congress on the horizon. And this uh, involves the problems within the Republican conference in the House of Representatives and in particular uh, uh, the, the difficulties uh, with the conservative wing of the Republican Party. There is a struggle going on for the ideological and political leadership of the Republican Party in the House. John Boehner's the Repub Republican leader, his fate was on the line. He had initially indicated support for the Bush administration's plans and then went back to find out that the right wing of his conference wasn't going to support this and was going to hold it against him if he did. He backed off and assumed the leadership of the opposition uh, within the negotiations rather than leadership in support of it, at least until further negotiations took place and movement uh, was had toward, uh, uh, with respect to things that the Republican conservatives wanted. <coughs> um, uh, it wasn't enough. Uh, 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 Boehner takes credit for moving some conservative votes in, in the direction of the plan, but, but not, uh, not enough. And so all of these features uh, and calculations interact to create uh, a very difficult and very complex political situation for the people who are in the middle of it. So the president said he was worried about me going over, so I'm going to stop. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, we're going to have questions. Uh, I said something to you guys at the beginning, which is, if you want to know what the greatest privilege of being a member of the university community is, it's being a member of a community that can summon this kind of intelligence to deal with real world issues of great mystery around us. I am most grateful to my colleagues, and you certainly lived up to my expectations. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple of questions because I'm going to guess however many of you line up, you might, a, uh, you might ask uh, some versions of these. So I'll just ask one. Here's a real-time, real-world question. Uh, say the vote is taking place in Congress right now. It's taking place sometime today. I think I was told after the markets close. Uh, and say you're within two or three votes of the bill passing or failing. That is not an imaginary scenario. Uh, and say somebody calls you as your lifeline uh, and says, what a, what's the thing I should do in this situation that over the next weeks and months would actually uh, contribute most to resolving this crisis? What would you tell them? <laughs> uh, what, what kind of power do I have? Am I Hank Paulson? Am I um, Nancy Pelosi? Am I Ben Bernanke? Who am I? <laughs> You're the person they called as their last best hope oh. of knowing what they have <laughs> to do. So, so I don't have any power. I'm just an advisor. You're the advisor, but you're an advisor to a person in a situation where a lot is on the line and what is right to do is profoundly unclear. Jim. Well, I, th I think Cam intimated this, but I, it needs a little bit of background here, and that is that money comes from really two areas. There's capital markets, which are now frozen, and then there's the banking market. Okay, and those, those are really very different. And I think the Fed uh, and uh, Paulson uh, and Bernanke get a lot of credit the other day for acting very swiftly when it appeared that something called the commercial paper market had frozen up. And because individuals were very fearful that money and money market funds were at risk because one of the funds had broken the buck. And they then extended, uh, uh, said they would back up all the money uh, that was then in money market funds so that they were protected, because you need that money to be keep going. In. Commercial market, commercial paper market is short-term paper uh, that people borrow against. I think that's an illustration, a little bit of what Cam was talking about what's happening in Sweden some time ago, and that is that if you look at commercial banking, uh, the key there is the liquidity issue 
of the, of the banks, the, uh, real banks. And we could think about ways of getting money very quickly uh, into the control of commercial banks so they would be lendable. I mean, the illustration of the money market funds was you kept the commercial paper market alive. And we should be looking at what we can be doing in commercial banking. It's going to be much more, much quicker than this uh, Rube Goldberg process we're going to have to go through to figure out how politically we can buy a bunch of trash from Wall Street. Okay. Please. So the, the proposal is um, an auction with one buyer and many sellers. And it's not clear that anybody in the federal government knows how to run that auction right. <laughs> so so the, usually the government is one seller, many buyers. That's how they auction off spectrum and, and oil leases. So they're pretty good on that one. But they're not maybe so good on the other one. And there's a lot of talk on, uh, in uh, newsletters and blogs about how this auction is going to be subject to a lot of adverse selection problems where the sellers know a lot more about the quality of the assets than the single buyer does. Uh, so this auction thing sounds dangerous to me. On the other hand, taking an equity stake in these banks means that we will have the same people who brought us the post office and the Social Security Administration now pulling on the levers of financial controls. So I'm going to take a very, um, I, I'd say, what can we do? Get the political risk out of the capital markets. Right now, half the gyrations in the, in the indexes are because people don't know whether they're going, to, they're going to be getting the subsidy or not getting the subsidy. Get the political risk out, that helps. Secondly, clean up the credit derivatives market. Impose that Chicago idea of the central clearinghouse so that we don't have the, we don't have, we don't have a clue in the credit derivatives. Remember that $70 trillion, $70 trillion. Third, regulate similar things reg similarly. Right now what we have is similar things aren't regulated similarly. I, if I'm a bank originating a mortgage, I'm regulated. If I'm a mortgage broker, I'm not. And finally, enforcers should enforce. Uh, one of the things that Jim Cox pointed to was the fact that people were sort of asleep at the switch in terms of taking care of business and imposing the regulations on the regulated. You either have a regulation or you don't, but if you have it, you should enforce it. So the, the, the superficial regulation with nothing underneath it is part of where we got to where we are now. That's not very glamorous, but I'm an accountant, so that's okay. <laughs> that was a great answer. Right. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add one thing, which is I would tell them to please not lose their nerve. Yeah. You know, the, because there's not just the consequences now as a, you know, that's, it's not just that that we care about here. There's also the precedents that are being set and what this does for the longer term. And, you know, so we had the LTCM bailout or arrangement that took place in, in uh, about a decade ago. and. Uh, you know, we have this issue of the Greenspan, perceived Greenspan put, we don't want to create more moral hazard as a result of just mucking something together quickly to solve some problem in the short term. Okay. I guess I would, um, I would lose no sleep if the bill fails tonight. Mm -hmm. It is such a mess. They've tossed stuff into it like tax credits for alternative energy, which is important to me, but not right now. And uh, to go into a 400-page bill in the Senate, um, it, it just, there are so many issues with it. Uh, I would much prefer, um, you know, something happen very quickly, and there's lots of possibilities. People have talked, uh, and actually, um, one addition uh, in the Senate plan is to raise the FDIC limit from 100 to 250,000. And look, this is really no big deal. The last time they set the limit was 1980. So just taking care of inflation, um, that is the equivalent of $280,000 today. So to set it at 250, it's kind of low hanging fruit. It's not gonna solve our problem. Um, a more dramatic measure would be to go in and guarantee all deposits for a period of three years. Okay, that would be dramatic because it would immediately instill confidence in the banking system. It would end the possibility of uh, bank runs. And uh, it is a measure that's not without precedent. So uh, indeed, uh, today, 
uh, I'm not sure it's actually approved by Ireland, but uh, Ireland took an extraordinary step today um, where they have guaranteed all deposits. Um, and that uh, for the Irish economy is a big deal because the deposits in Ireland are worth more than their GDP. So in, in terms of the US, it would be like a, uh, a $30 trillion guarantee. So it, it's an extraordinary step. It's not the sort of thing of the, of the same size for the US, but it's something that could be done to immediately instill confidence. Um, I'm not a person that wants the government to take over all financial institutions. It's a nightmare to think of the government owning uh, Goldman Sachs or Morgan <laughs> Stanley. Uh, nobody wants that. Uh, what I'm talking about in terms of equity injection is a modest equity in injection of 2 to 5% in all financial institutions. It would be a passive investment that would be unwound after five to seven years. That would provide the liquidity to jumpstart um, the credit markets. We can't have a situation where small businesses um, can't do uh, the basic things that they do. They need working capital and you starve them and you send our economy into a serious recession. So now I have one more question because uh, I'm really glad I asked that one because those were some great answers. Uh, which is this, uh, I don't know who's going to be elected president and neither do you and I'm not asking who you favor. What I'm asking is whoever is elected, will they have any fun? Uh, in, the following, <laughs> in the following strict sense of the word, which is everybody comes to power hoping to do things, hoping to make new investments, hoping to blaze new trails. Uh, and so I'm just asking, what's your assessment of the margin for that in the next administration, or will it all be gobbled up by the consequences of this? Ken. It, it's the ideal time uh, to be running for president, because uh, whoever wins, They've got four years, and if the crisis is over, even after three and a half years, they will take credit for uh, solving the crisis. And, and if it's not? Then they're in trouble, obviously. <laughs> oh, but then they'll blame it on the previous administration and say they, they deserve another four years. And, uh, and indeed, that's, that's a potentially credible, uh, credible commitment. Well, you know, I've, I've been alive for a while. Uh, my academic career began in the 1970s, a decade during which the earning power of American faculty salaries declined 30%. There were seven recessionary years out of 10. Uh, and then I can remember the end of the internet bubble when everybody thought the economy was melting down to zero, uh, but a very short time later, it was actually galloping faster than it had ever been before. Uh, and it's one of the questions I put to you before, and I've heard some answers, but I bring it back to you again, uh, which is, uh, 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 and, and Craig, I think you made this very clear. We don't, one of the troubles with this crisis is we don't know for sure what kind of crisis it is. What? I meant to put that in the form of a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Here's my question. What's your, what's your hunch? Is this one of those things, you know, when Franklin Roosevelt was elected, he hadn't solved the problem of the Depression after three and a half years, right? right? He had not solved it after seven and a half years, and he was elected yet again. Is this that kind of situation that we're on the eve of, or is it something more like the SNL crisis or uh, the bursting of the internet bubble? That's, uh, that's a very hard question to answer. Um, my, own, my own personal leaning is to, is to lean away from the doom and gloom scenario. My, my suspicion is that a lot of, a lot of the, the issues will, in a sense, be solved by um, making sure that this liquidity situation doesn't, doesn't uh, be, become worse. Um, but a absolutely, the, the design of any kind of bailout is going to be very important um, in terms of t two very crucial things are going to depend on that. One is you know what, and, and these will have lasting effects. One is what is the cost going to be to the to the treasury, and making sure that you do the bailout the right way. And you know people have hinted about what the right way to do this is, but doing it the right way to minimize the cost to the taxpayer is definitely the way to go in terms of minimizing the the outlay to, to the government and minimizing government debt. Um, and all of those things are going to you know, have an, an effect on the, on the earlier part of your question, which had to do with, is the new president going to have any fun? Um, 
And then the other side of, of designing the bailout correctly is just this issue of our, once, we, once we do this bailout, do we then have something approximating a healthy banking system? And if they do the bailout the wrong way, the answer will clearly be no. And if they do it the right way, whatever that is, and there's a number of good proposals, I think, um, then the answer is maybe yes, because many countries have gone through episodes like this. There have been 42 banking crises in the last two decades, uh, or the last three decades around the world, most of them bigger than the one we're facing. And many of the countries have come out of them reasonably healthy. Um, you know, we can hope for something like the Sweden or Norway outcome where they didn't even uh, have a recession in the wake of their banking crises, but that might be hoping for a little too much because they were a little bit smaller than this one. Great answer. Great answer. We have mics on the phone on the floor, and I will invite you to them. I'll, I'll just ask one question as people approach it. I have endless questions, so if you don't come down, I'll just keep asking them, uh, which is this. Uh, would you be prophesying that the relative position of the United States internationally will be altered permanently by this, or is it your thought that this might be a problem that will lead to a correction of our system that might leave us either in about the same place or perhaps even in a stronger place? Anybody? There's plenty of reason uh, to believe that uh, the risk of the United States has increased. So uh, given this episode, uh, investors look at the U.S. differently. It used to be uh, the ultimate uh, safe haven, the flight to quality would always go to the U.S. However, when they look at, at the country itself, while there's a lot of positives, um, there are significant negatives. This credit crisis is a good example of, uh, of one of the negatives. There's many other factors that, uh, that I could list in, in terms of underinvestment that the U.S. has made in its economy uh, for the future um, that would also contribute to this uh, increased risk. So yes, I believe that the U.S.'s position is uh, changing. Uh, it has been changing, but this maybe will accelerate it. Related to that, there's a lot of things that are going on uh, around the world in capital markets uh, that has um, made the raising capital competitive around the world. What well, used to be just in New York, and you know those are you know they other markets uh, have gotten stronger, more efficient, uh, more reliable. Uh, if we handle the banking part of this uh, inappropriately, so that it appears. Um, um, uh, uh, to uh, indicate that politics rather than reason and, and uh, uh, wisdom uh, prevail, then I think we would be in jeopardy. I mean, uh, how, so how we play this uh, will not restore America back to where it was in 95, uh, because a lot of things have changed outside of America that have made it, uh, you know, raising capital a much bigger and more uh, predictable pond than it is right now. But if we bumble this in terms of corrupting it with politics uh, and uh, choose solutions that appear to be not only unworkable but terrifically expensive, uh, then we erode the confidence going forward for, and, and we're not going to be able to get it back. Sir. Uh, Wadiya Haddaji, I'm a PhD at uh, FICWA Finance. Uh, basically, I see this as, as two issues, two different issues even though they are related. There is the issue of liquidity that uh, Professor Harvey been mentioning, is that the fact that we have this crisis in Wall Street and if liquidity uh, keeps drying up, we're not going to have sufficient funds to provide to small businesses and co this could continue to hurt the economy. But there is a second issue that I don't see many people discussing, is that there are a lot of homeowners that are losing their homes and foreclosures continue to, raise, uh, to, uh, to rise. And it seems to me that you know, this bailout is solving one issue. So the bailout is like the government, my understanding the government is going to buy out these asset-backed securities or, more, or mortgage pools. But then as a result, in the long term, if the foreclosures continue, this, this, basically the government will be responsible for, for people losing their homes. So they'll be basically indirectly kicking people out of their homes. And for, my, for me, I see that as a huge political uh, you know, consequences to this, and it seems to me that the government is not dealing with it. They are just dealing with the crisis in Wall Street, trying to solve the banking crisis, 
but they're not trying to find simple solution to maybe renegotiate mortgages, maybe uh, as simple as increasing maturities for this, uh, uh, you know, sub, uh, subprime mortgages, and as a result, you know, monthly payments are lower and less foreclosures occur. So I don't know what you guys think about these issues. I, I saw Catherine and then Cam, and if then if there are others, please. So here's the theory, and then you can tell me if you think this will work. <coughs> so you buy up all the securities that are backed by the mortgages, and so now you're the owner, and you go to the servicer. That's the person who has the power to do what you're talking about. And you say to the servicer, I want you to go through these mortgages, mortgage by mortgage, and I want you to figure out which are the ones where we can collect the cash, which are the ones where we can collect a lot of the cash, especially if we stretch out the payments, which are the ones where we can collect a lot of the cash if we stretch out the payments and reset the interest rate? And which are the ones where, doggone it, this was one of these things where I think maybe there was a fraud on this mortgage application. So there's more categories than that. But that's the job of the servicer. And once you own those securities, you go to the servicer and say, I got the paper now, and this is what I want you to do to protect my investment. So just because a person has fallen behind in his mortgage payments does not mean that the mortgage is worthless. In many cases, it's the bank's job to, to go to that person and say, let's, let's make a deal. Because if I have to lose 20% of the value of the mortgage, I still get 80%. Well, I think you're looking at this. Remember, these are the people who did bring us the post office. I understand your point. But if they do it right, they can make this happen. But they can't make it happen all that fast. Yeah. It, I, um, I agree with the point, and indeed, um, I would uh, direct you to my website for my proposals, which actually deal exactly with this point. So one of the problems we've got, we've got people living in a house. Um, maybe they bought it for $200,000, and they got a $200,000 mortgage. The house today is worth one okay, so And they're, they're underwater, they, and they're, they're frozen. They don't want to spend. They've got this huge obligation hanging over them. What do you do? The bank, if the bank is the servicer, doesn't want to necessarily foreclose because foreclosure is costly. It's costly uh, in, in human capital. It's also costly because it affects the value of the houses around this house. Okay, so you want to avoid that. So one of the ideas is the so-called cram down. So you reset the principal back down to 150. And one idea here is to the bank actually has got some self-interest to do this, but maybe not all the way to 150. Provide a direct incentive for the bank to do that so the government could share some of the cram down cost. However, and this is important, um, they should get some of the possible return if the value of the house does climb back up uh, above 200. So you would cram down with the provision to participate uh, in the upside, both the government and the bank. And that addresses you know, the larger problem. One of the uh, criticisms I've had is that we're looking at only part of the problem, and we need to design a policy that is comprehensive, that deals with all of the components, rather than just reacting to uh, a particular crisis that uh, is in the media. And we have to instill confidence in the consumers, and uh, one of the ways to do that, I think, is to operate on the principle of the mortgages. Uh, David, then, Jim. Yeah. Uh, the, the problem you, you mentioned it was one of the most important substantive features of the defeat of the bill uh, I, I, on, uh, on Monday. Uh, it's a very peculiar political situation in, in the House. Usually, a bill comes to the House floor and one end of the spectrum or the other thinks it's a peachy idea and how much people like it declines as you move further away from that wing. So either conservative Republicans like a bill or liberal Democrats like a bill uh, not, uh, uh, in this polarized environment we have. What happened on Monday was that if this bill was brought down disproportionately by opposition from both ends of the spectrum, it's the extremes of both the, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party that disproportionately voted no. And the reason that liberal Democrats voted no those that did, was the, uh, uh, this feature, that nothing was done in this bill for the people who held, uh, uh, who, uh, uh, whose mortgages were, uh, were at risk and who were at risk of losing their, uh, their homes. 
Uh, a majority of the Black Caucus voted against this bill. A majority of the Hispanic Caucus voted against this bill, even though a majority of Democrats voted yes. And all, all the members of both of those caucuses are Democrats. Um, so uh, uh, I, I didn't see the final uh, uh, version of the Senate bill. I, uh, but um, uh, this morning, at least, they were talking about putting some feature in the bill uh, that would take care of in one way or another, uh, uh, some aspects of, of this problem. Something would be done for uh, uh, homeowners whose houses were at risk. Jim. Uh, just to add a couple of points here, uh, this is a, a great question here. Uh, Wall Street Journal reported on Friday last week that 40% of the uh, home, more, uh, homes had uh, mortgages that were greater than their value. Uh, we don't know what that difference was. Uh, yesterday's paper reports on a study that was made of efforts following the legislation that passed in June in Congress to see what banks were doing under the incentives that were there for uh, adjusting mortgages. The answer was the adjustments uh, that did occur uh, rarely touched principal and rarely touched interest, <laughs> which doesn't do very much good if your home's already underwater because your fair market value is low. Uh, my own survey, um, uh, banks, in the spring, maybe things have changed there. Let's assume people were rational. Uh, the banks in the spring, that the process there is to, when there is a troubled loan and it doesn't appear that you're going to be able to work it out, to, to foreclose on it right away because the, the, the culture is you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. The prices could go down even more. Uh, and then there's been terrific resistance that to the pro uh, proposition that used to be in the bankruptcy law that when the banks came and passed their laws a few years ago that redid the re bankruptcy law, personal bankruptcy laws, there used to be a provision that allowed the, uh, 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 that process to rejigger the, the, the loan that somebody was behind on. That's one of the push points. That, that, that's no longer there. That's what, something that's being discussed. So what's interesting is the incentive package that was passed and I, I can't remember uh, whether it was May or June, uh, the $300 billion package at that point, that's really not brought about a terrific uh, change in behavior on the part of the banks in dealing with this. And then the final point I'll make is that, you know, economists are all saying that this is a, a, a multi-headed hydra, that you need to take multiple steps. And so the fact that we're going to have this one thing that everybody's talking about in Congress right now really ignores the fact that we should have multiple steps that are being suggested here uh, and in the Congress uh, to get ourselves out of this problem. Craig, Craig I, just, a call on. Yeah, I just wanted to add one point that's going to make me seem somewhat heartless. But, um, you know, just as I wouldn't want to bail out all the shareholders of the banks because that sends, you know, a bad message and creates moral hazard, it's also the case we don't want people to be keeping their homes. We want one of the lessons of this episode to be that getting a, a low teaser rate, adjustable rate mortgage, and with no money down, um, and stretching your payments to be a large fraction of your income is something that maybe you don't want to do. And uh, so some, some people losing their homes is a necessary part of, uh, of sending that message. Sir. You're right. Bazaza, Most people hate you. Yeah. I had a question actually for uh, Cam and James primarily. The question is regarding being a consumer. Is there any concern that if there's a large scale consolidation in the commercial banking industry for, you know, there's only two, there were only two investment banks previously, now there's only a fair amount or a handful, that there might be some type of cartel or there might be you know, some type of oligopoly that might occur in the, in the later future? I was impressed to you, but I'm not sure you were yeah, able to completely hear, hear yeah. The question is, if there's considerable, considerable consolidation in the commercial banking industry, do you, was there any concern that there might be some type of oligopoly or cartel later on in the future? Well, I guess, uh, you know, what we've seen is three large banks emerge. So as winners. So Citibank and Bank of America Morgan. and... Uh, JP Morgan. You can't forget JP Morgan. Yep. Um, so, but there's still, you know, uh, a large number of banks out there. Uh, I think that this consolidation was, you know, obviously not strategic. Uh, it, 
arose mainly as a result of this crisis and some bargain basement prices. Uh, do I see the banking system uh, morphing into um, kind of a European system dominated by very few large banks? I don't think so. Uh, you know, a lot of the, and Jim could certainly uh, talk on this, a lot of this has to do with the way that banks are regulated in the United States. So I do believe, given the size of these uh, three banks, and there could be a fourth emerge also, um, and that Wells Fargo is in very good shape to make some acquisitions, and uh, you could see a scenario where it becomes the, uh, the number four. Uh, but given the size of these banks, um, there is the specter of kind of the Walmart style of uh, commercial and slash investment banking uh, kind of emerging. That they're so big that they've got uh, efficiencies of scale that the local bank in whatever state just has no way of uh, competing against uh, this size. So we might be headed in that direction. Please. Right. Um, My name is Ahmad. I'm a graduate student in economics. Uh, my question is more, um, you know, I mean, given in the, in the past few months and probably in the next few months, the U.S. government will be heavily intervening in the economy. So how would this affect the credibility of the World Bank's and IMF's messages to the other countries that are always pro-market and against government interventions in the policies? I, I had this great question from a, a student after I did uh, a a uh, town hall meeting at uh, Fuqua School of Business. And the student was um, from China, and she didn't ask the question during the presentation, but it came up afterwards, and it's too bad she didn't ask it uh, during the presentation. She asked me, what, what is the difference between the U.S. system and the Chinese system? What, what is communism and capitalism? It's, it seems the same. You're doing the same things. And, uh, and I guess you know, the point here is that uh, things change very quickly depending upon circumstances. And people that might be very conservative all of a sudden think that the government must intervene in this particular situation. So the, the lines uh, blur and uh, you know, it's, it's hard to be consistent. Craig. Uh, I used to work for the World Bank, so I was quite familiar with uh, <laughs> going to meetings where people would say things, say things about, well, why does our debt to GDP need to be lower than your debt, debt to GDP, and so forth. And um, that's, a, that's a fair point. My answer to that question was always, well, you know, my advice, you know, is the same advice that I would give to the U.S. government. And it doesn't matter that the U.S. Got, you know, the fact that the U.S. government doesn't necessarily follow the advice of the, of the people at the World Bank and the IMF and, and other Americans that go abroad and give, give economic advice. The fact that we don't follow our own advice doesn't mean that other countries shouldn't follow it. Um, so it's really, really what this is is more something about how we should get our house in order um, just as much as other people should get their houses in order. Uh, we shouldn't all, you know, create disorderly houses. That shouldn't be the message. I think we have time for one last question, please. Thank you. I'm Jonathan Amgott. Um, I'm a sophomore at public policy. Um, and Professor Rohde, you talked about how the presidential candidates, their campaigns are having kind of an indirect role through affecting the way that congressmen are voting. Um, and I'm wondering if if the candidate should have more of a role at this point, um, and if their role should be more than just a rhetorical trading of blame that's kind of taken place so far. So maybe that's a little more political than questions have been so far, but I'd appreciate it, or if anybody else has some input. Thank you. Well, um, I, it, <clears throat> I guess it depends. My, my answer depends on what sense one means should. Um, um, it was pretty remarkable, I thought, that uh, um, uh, in, in terms of, of the politics of the country over the past decade or more, uh, that both of the presidential candidates were brought into the room to sit in on the negotiations and to be a part of this consideration because it was a recognition that this is a long-term problem and one of those two men is, is going to be the one who's going to have to uh, uh, deal um, in, in a much longer time frame than just the next few months until uh, until they're inaugurated in that. So, um, 
um, so in the sense of should their, their, uh, their views be given disproportionate weight um, in the negotiations, for example? Should they be influential over the choices of the, uh, uh, the, the various policymakers and that? Um, and and I, think, I think a lot of people think the answer to that is, is yes to a degree, but it partially depends, of course, on what their views are. That is, whether they're similar or different. Uh, I, th I think that if both McCain and Obama um, call for, advocate the same things, they'll be listened to um, uh, to a degree by the current administration, by the leaders of the, uh, of the parties in, uh, in the House and, and Senate. Um, the degree to which they'll be listened to the by the rank and file members of the respective chambers, and particularly the House, is, is more problematic, I think, and that because there are, um, uh, as I tried to indicate earlier, so, some pretty strong ideological considerations uh, at stake here. This is most true with respect to the Republicans in the, in the House, but it's also true to a degree uh, with, uh, with the Democrats. I mean, there's a certain <coughs> irony that, that Obama is uh, painted, I mean, McCain said in the, in the, the last debate uh, that you know, the most liberal member of the Senate, uh, but uh, uh, at least in this context, we're certainly not getting the most liberal policy proposals from this, uh, from this person, which m may be conditioned by a mistake about what his ideology is or may be conditioned by the fact that he's a candidate for president and can't follow his, his own ideology. Well, my friends, uh, I began by alluding to tumultuous times. Uh, we don't know what, to, uh, wh what the news of the next days and weeks will work out. Uh, but one thing we do know is this circumstance won't be escaped by luck. Uh, it'll be escaped by people making choices, thoughtful and intelligent choices. Uh, first of all, the choice of intelligently diagnosing the nature of the problem so that one will be able intelligently to choose the nature of the remedy. Uh, uh, whatever your point of view on matters, and this has been an admirably nonpartisan panel, I think, uh, I have myself been grateful for uh, the extraordinary range of expertise and thoughtfulness that's present here. Uh, and I just would conclude by thanking my excellent colleagues for a great afternoon. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.